welcome everyone. Um, unfortunately, the first job I have today is a sad one, which is to let you know that one of our speakers, Mohammed James, from the government of Sierra Leone, has not been able to make it because he wasn't able to get a travel visa in time. Um, it's worth noting that that is quite often an issue, particularly for speakers from the Global South, so particularly sad. Um, however, we do have two amazing speakers for this session, uh, Friday Ode from the Accountability Lab in Nigeria and Jasmina Hayes from Integrity Action in the UK. Um, so I would like to welcome our first speaker, Friday, who is going to speak on the civic tech ecosystem in Nigeria. Uh, do you want to use a microphone? Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I don't think I want to bore you people this morning. Um, so many tech experts in the room, and I'm kind of scared. Like, I don't want to say what somebody's going to come and question and answers and put me up. OK. Um, civic tech in Nigeria, the evolution of the ecosystem in Nigeria. Um, um, as we, well. Arguably, Nigeria remains um, one of the biggest tech spaces um, in the continent, as it is with the population and the entry of internet and um, penetration of internet as well. So one of the things we've had in recent times is um, development of hubs um, and co-creation spaces. Um, we've seen in 2011 um, the first co-creation hub or civic um, hub, which was um, where people, young people came and had access to develop tech activities and tech platforms. Um, in 2011 as well, there was the launch of the Mobile West Africa, um, now the most prominent tech conference in West Africa, um, being attended by people from all around Africa. We've also seen Google and Facebook set up uh, accelerator programs to address civic tech, and Della um, Ventures Park, Google Colab, and Civic Hive, which is one of the recent ones which we've seen um, having effects with young people. We've also seen innovation hubs in Nigeria, at least um, the government is making efforts to put hubs at every space in the geopolitical zones. Um, currently, we have in the north and the south and the west, also one in the east. So what drives civic tech in Nigeria? Um, from studies, civic tech can be largely grouped into three areas, um, both overlapping, um, looking at government technology, citizens to government, and citizens to citizens. Um, most, most on the list, we have voting, which um, we just finished um, in February 2019, and a couple of people developed some platforms, um, which we'll be looking at. One of them is Uzabe, which was developed by connected development to measure the impact of threats and snatching of ballots, boxes, and all that that has to do with voting in Nigeria. Technology, this is also technology used to improve um, voting processes, such as the digital votes guides and tool for simplifying registration. So what are the major players we have in the within the ecosystem in Nigeria. Um, we have Budgets, who runs Tracker, a social platform for active citizens who are interested in monitoring budgets in public spaces. Um, hopefully, um, we have what has helped them so far is engaging young people at the rural areas um, to inform them of budgeting processes and budgeting, budgeting platforms and how they can hold government accountable using this platform. They've also um, informed them of city, um, constituency projects which are captured on the budget and how citizens can engage with government as well. Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, we have Connected Development, um, who recently just launched Zabi. It's a real-time platform to map elections in the 36 states. Um, that was as well active, but um, we've not measured the impact yet. Um, we're hoping to see what outcomes they have for us at the moment. We also have PBDC who have developed an open contracting platform called Budeshi. Um, so one of the things I'll be talking about in, after, in the next some, a few slides after now, it's about data security. So we found out that the government also decided to launch a platform for open contracting as well called um, 
Nokoko, Nokopo, sorry. Um, so some of the things we've seen, because of data security, the government said to them, oh, we want you to hand over this platform to us, but we had this back and forth discussions and it didn't work. So the government decided to go ahead to design a platform for procurement and contract delivery process ac across their public sectors. Another one which we've seen in recent times is Citizens Gather, um, focused on the justice sector. Um, Aim at improving the pace of justice, de justice delivered through tech. So the process is um, making a complaint or a case, um, adding a timeline to the case, sharing the justice clock, and pro, bo pro bono lawyers are engaged to identify these cases which have been identified, and um, they take up these cases. Um, so far, they have been able to secure um, the release of more than 50 people in custody, intervene in over 1,000 situations, um, and they, Include involving attempted extension by police and judicial officials. Gavel also provides legal counsel, counsel to average of 18 people in a week. So what hasn't worked? So we looked at a couple of platforms um, and spoke to a couple of organizations and we found out um, about Revoda. Revoda is also an online um, voting um, platform where you um, where they give information to citizens about voting and um, they try to be as social as they can but after the 2011 elections we found out um, they ceased to exist which was a bit of concern to us um, also report a bribe um, helping to fight corruption with a text once at a time so we also found out this platform um, on their websites it's little or less not active as the case may be um, so what have they missed out so one, some of the reasons we looked at is um, they focus on the tech as the make, main solution rather than involving the people and engaging the society. Another thing we looked at is um, a couple of them have just jumped into the tech field without considering a pilot program to design a pilot program which can see how effective citizens can use these platforms. Um, another thing we've looked at is poor design with little or no inclusion of the communities during their planning phase. So little, um, at some point, um, we, expect the, we expect citizens' engagement at the end of it all. But at, if you look at it from the perspective of the platform, it's seen that the people who you are designing this um, tech for, they have little or no access for it. So you still have to go back to them and explain how to use it. You have to teach them how to use it. Um, use the platform as well. Um, we also have overly technical design for targeted communities. So, um, like I said initially, I, I'm tech experts, so you have this fantastic idea and you go out and you design your platform without considering the society and the community. Um, so we've also looked at this and said to them, oh, don't you think you have to consider the marginalized um, as well as the minorities in the communities. Because after designing, who uses these tech applications? How do they get access? So another thing is access. So what are the strengths? We've come up with um, a SWOT analysis for tech organizations in Nigeria. And um, we've seen that there's a huge market with youth participation, um, mostly domiciled in Lagos um, and Abuja, which is the capital city of Nigeria. Um, however, we still have young people who are at the other geopolitical zones and we want to engage them. So we looked at how can we do this? How do we make it exciting? How do we ex make these platforms exciting for them? Um, we've seen a couple of um, engagements on Twitter as well, um, Facebook as well. So we will be glad to see more done about this, um, making it exciting. So another thing we looked at is the leadership and expertise in the application of technology for engaging youths and civil society. So in most of this organization, um, making reference to budget um, led by a young person um, and, other, and connected development as well. Um, there's also the ability to strengthen in local and national and international issues. There's also a growing social network of influential youths in Nigeria who wants to make the difference using civic tech. 
There's also increased visibility across sectors and growing relationships with established organizations, companies, UN agencies, and foundations. So what are the weaknesses of civic tech in Nigeria? Um, so I, like I mentioned earlier, one of the things we've seen is um, consist consistency project being monitored by the parliament. Um, so we had openness a couple of years ago and we had that engagement. So a couple of people decided to, des um, one of the things budget did is to design tracker. However, we had another organization who designed Udeme as the same platform. So we had a concern of um, having duplicate projects, how do we measure, how do we engage people? You are still engaging the same targeted group, so having duplicate project might be um, confusing as well. Another thing we saw is the lack of use by local communities and public interest. So with expert techn technologies, high tech, and how do we engage local community at the local level? How do we make them use these things? How do we teach them how to use this? Um, Tracker has been one effective platform which has done this. So they hold town hall meetings um, almost every month from different parts of the countries. Um, we also have complicated end user interface and system reliability. Um, so still talking about the user interface. High tech, um, as good as it may look, um, we still have the minorities which are, being, which are the targeted group in Nigeria. Um, how do we engage them to fully use this um, optimally? Uh, the cost of hiring and training and knowledge transfer is actually high. Um, so that's a thing of concern for us as well. Um, funding is also one of it, um, which is quite challenging for a couple of people to develop their platforms. We also have the political influence. Um, so we just finished our elections, and as, it, as the case may be, um, there's a political interest in most of these tech platforms, how it affects them, how it's going to affect their um, political affiliations, um, political appointments in offices, and how it's going to relate with the public as well. We also have the lack of formal expertise on behavioral science and people-centered design. Also, another challenge is um, most of these tech platforms are not focused on people. So it's more like having this platform, um, having this fantastic idea at the surface. Um, so we looked at it and said, OK, why not have a people-centered design where you can have a bottom-up approach instead of a top-down approach? Um, also, lack of internet is um, Nevertheless, in as much as Nigeria stands to be one of the biggest um, access to, has the one of the biggest access to internet, um, we still have the rural areas where the population lies and they don't have access to internet as well. So, what are the opportunities for civic tech in Nigeria? Um, one, leveraging on ex existing co-working space. Um, so exciting to know that a couple of co-working cool spaces are developing around Nigeria. Um, almost at every geopolitical zone, there's one um, which has been developed, um, most especially in Lagos, with a focus in Lagos. Lagos has some exciting spaces where young people are working from. Investors in Lagos, Abuja, and other cities. So these places are um, target areas where young people can have access. Um, the opportunities for the future is also better measurements and communication of impact. Um, it, so I, we looked up a couple of things, and um, different organizations are measuring different things, um, starting from users, from time spent on these applications, um, from the wins, from the votes, from the shares, from the, to the install, and et cetera. Um, there's also increase in civic accelerators and incubators. Um, excitingly, we had, um, we've had Google and Facebook in the, in the field of play as well. So there's potentials for closer collaboration and coordination between civic tech funders. Um, in-house government agencies, there's also the possibility of having in-house government agency hiring top tech talent and applying innovative methodolog methodologies. Um, looking at Nokopo, um, They've been supported a great deal with, um, by PPDC, who also um, designed Budeshi. And um, on the open contracting platform, there's a good um, knowledge base from PPDC, which they are also leveraging on. Um, the interest in civic tech is also growing. Um, also, low-cost tools have been adopted, and the ability to combine online and offline technologies. Um, 
looking at a couple of, like I said initially, with the geopolitical zones in Nigeria, a couple of people are now focusing on local-cost local tools using SMS um, platforms to engage with the communities. Um, we also saw that um, to deepen the knowledge and understanding of youths in civic technology, it's necessary. Um, partners with socially responsible community groups to maximize outreach. Um, lastly, um, to improve methods to better educate citizens in the use of tech. So what are the threats to civic tech in Nigeria? Um, first on the list is sustainability, which is quite um, another challenging issue for us. Um, like we looked at Revoda, and we, um, one of the things we looked at is, is it was designed in 2011, um, but after 2011, what happened? Security issues um, in the Northeast, which is affecting the country as well at large. We also have data privacy issues, um, which was one of the concerns for Nokopo, for um, the Bureau of Public um, Procurement, which after PBDC launched um, Budeshi, they looked at it and said, um, why not hand over this to us? But on the concerns were, since it was designed by PPDC, um, there might be data issues which they, might, they have to deal with and privacy issues as well. Um, there's also broken governance, education, and tax system with widespread corruption. Um, another threat is the ability to be consistent, especially during metamorphosis. Um, the high cost of technology is another thing of concern, which is a threat to young people um, engaging in civic tech. Um, also, citizens' digital skills is a thing of concern. Looking at our Lagos and Abuja, which is much high tech, but other locations in Nigeria seems to have challenges with digital skills. Um, power, lastly, is also a major issue. So what are some ideas we came up with? Um, the first is sustainable business models and reliable revenue streams. This digital evolution shouldn't be with we shouldn't be with foreign capital alone. Um, it should also have the platform where we have local organizations, um, the private sectors also having investments in developing civic tech platforms. Um, we have ag agonistic as to organizational reform. Um, some civic, civic tech organizations are for profits, and some of them are not, not, not for profits. Um, we also saw that um, a couple of not um, for profit organization who are doing civic tech as payment platforms, um, having that citizen engagement more than the not for profit ones. So we could actually have that platform where they can leverage and work um, with each other. So the right kind of data is another idea which we can also explore. A greater volume of citizen feedback does not necessarily translate to improved government response. So the fact that you have people engaging with your platform. Um, so for Nigeria, one of the things we know is there's engagement with the citizens, but the response for the government is a bit poor. So you don't necessarily get that feedback or the response to educational issues which you're advocating for or for health platforms, yeah. So building the right solution is another idea which we've come, in, which we've come up with. Um, greater understanding of governments as a customer in need of the right tools. Some platforms don't take into account how government officials perceive, use, and respond to these technologies as tools to help them not to justify problems, but to assist in solving them as well. Um, also, we, we're also leveraging on this platform using the open government plat um, partnership in Nigeria as well to co-create um, platforms of um, civic tech platforms to engage government and make them understand why we're doing this and building the right tools as well. Um, there's finite number of users, a proper synergy between governments, media, and civil society organizations and innovation hubs can ensure both civil society and media are equipped with necessary technological schools, um, tools for sustainability. Um, another thing is the accountability incubator, which um, we run at Accountability Lab. Um, engaging young people to develop ideas, develop skills, and work together um, in collaboration. 
So what are the takeaways from Nigeria which we have come up with? Um, the impact of civic tech efforts have rightly been questioned. The two, impact of the tools, who is using them, and how are they using them? It's another thing we have looked at. Um, also, civic tech is still finding its foot, footing in Nigeria, and with so many smart, creative young people pushing for civic tech onwards, it will evolve in the near future. Civic tech organizations in Nigeria should develop creative partnership with leading global organizations in the space. Um, talk about data kind, talk about engineering room, talk about budgets, um, talk about connected development as well. And lastly, tech is not the solution, but an enabler. The human part of all this is the major solution. So if we don't engage the citizens, um, the tech might as well be another platform for people to just play with. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that overview, Friday. Um, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Jasmina Hayes, speaking on citizen monitoring in Nepal. Good morning all, thank you very much for having me here. I'll try to be very, very brief and I just need um, tech support to tell me if video is gonna play or no? Oh, okay, we'll try. So before I start, I would like to, oh, how does this work? I would like to tell you a little bit about our approach. Our approach is very, very citizen focused. Everything that we do is very much bottom up. We're a British charity. We don't have physical presence in any of the countries where we work. So we very much rely on the talent, willingness, and passion of our civil society partners and citizens in Global South to really make this happen. So how it works, civil society organizations, our partners who are deeply embedded in communities, will run the processes of selecting volunteer monitors, ordinary citizens, who have the passion to do civic duty. Often they will have highly vested interest to monitor local projects like building of primary school, hospital, and etc. Monitors be, monitor on behalf of their community. So what they will do, they will visit these projects in case of infrastructure, say once fortnightly, but also seek an input from their fellow citizens about is this working? Is it not working? What do you think? Do we need another fifth? Do we need fifth school when we actually don't have a hospital and etc. and etc. All the findings are uploaded on a platform that we are managing. It's called Development Check. Platform is, I would agree with Friday, with you Friday. It's another tech tool. Um, what we are very proud of is that first of all, it's populated by citizens. It's populated. Um, with qualitative and quantitative data in case of infrastructure, is project being built as described in Bill, bill of Quantities, is medicine free of charge as intended, as intended in legislation. On qualitative side, people will say, actually what's deeply embedded in our belief is that we don't want to take this medicine. So why is it here anyway? Um, our tech tool, all the data is captured in real time. It's autonomous, so it's only citizens who have the power to upload data onto our platform. If they find a problem in project implementation, they're the only ones who can upload it on the system, and actually they're the only ones who can say this problem has been resolved. So we don't take commitment or guarantee from the government who says, yes, we have heard you, that's a really terrible problem. We, we absolutely agree. But give us a couple of, time, a couple of months or a year to fix this because we don't have resources and etc. For us, that doesn't exist. Problem remains visible for the world to see till it's really resolved from, from the perspective of, of citizens. Um, so that's why the methodology. What I'm here to show you is our project in Nepal. Um, it's very focused on reconstruction of housing. Um, it's incredibly problematic process that carries on. 
Um, and through it, what we would like to do is to really showcase what tech and passion of citizens, when you bring them together, really, really can do. And in front of you, you have a couple of questions that, um, that I will attempt to answer. I'm not sure if this link will work. If it doesn't, oh yeah, it works. So just to very briefly show you what it looks like. So um, about citizens have monitored, if we can scroll down, 784 homes that are being uh, built in very rural part of um, Nepal, in Sinto Pachok. If you have been there, you know, you know you have to have very strong ties to move from house to house. Um, what government has decided to do is to break down the process of reconstruction in five key steps that to citizens make no logic whatsoever, but the government wanted to hold a tight rein um, on international organizations flocking in to do rebuilding process. So it made sense from Kathmandu. But what it doesn't make sense is when you are a 50-year-old woman living on your own and someone tells you actually to have your house rebuilt, what you need to collect is one ton of stones. Like, when you see what one ton of stones is, I, you know, I, I really don't think I would have emotional stamina or physical one to do it. Once you've collected those stones, you issue the first tranche that probably won't cover it. So what you begin to think, right, I've collected all of this, so how do I progress onto walls? And you know what? Builders are very much in demand across the country, so the only way to keep Indian builder when they are in your village is for you to give them money up front, money that hasn't reached your pocket. So what normally happens is that, you know, the whole process is incredibly tricky. The people who are having their houses rebuilt are younger people who have access to additional funds and etc. So monitors passionately took this tech tool and they said, well, this is an opportunity for us to really showcase what is happening in reality. One thing that really surprised us that, that came through all of this is the passion of citizens of Nepal in rural communities um, to receive international assistance, but on their own terms. They were very good and very articulate in not wanting that international assistance to undermine the culture and dynamics that they do have. Um, if we can scroll a bit down, they have another thing that really surprised me because I work for international and non-governmental organization. I've always been in this sector. I thought that the world is so mistrusting of us. But frankly, citizens in Nepal do trust us and they want to work with us um, again. If we can now move on to other slides, please. Right, um, so going back to these questions, my answer to all three of them is yes, yes, yes. Um, the f but I wanted to share with you a couple of things worth keeping in mind if you are in pursuit of supporting citizens to provide open feedback. Um, people are perfectly capable when explained in, for them, acceptable terms to collect quantitative and qualitative data, regardless of their level of education, understanding of bill of quantities and tech. In our model, they will monitor in groups, so that's the way how we overcome differences among these individuals and bring everybody um, to the same level. But the thing is, people get bored, and they get awfully bored, and they don't want your question of, on 1,055 questions to answer whatever um, we want to find out. For them, the rule of thumb is 30, thank you very much, because there's a life beyond all of this. And as someone has said last, um, yesterday in one of the sessions, it's what happens in between changing nappies and cooking meals. Um, on the same question, because in our model, data is collected by volunteers. It's collected by people like community members. We get very frank answers, sometimes things that really shock us. Um, and I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind. In behavioral science, we know this. We trust people like us. So why should anyone 
We work in Kenya as well. Trust me to appear there as white woman living in London to really hear them out. It doesn't work. Absolutely doesn't. Um, in our model, important thing to keep in mind is this is not complaint mechanism. This is not bring your bring forward things that don't work. In our model, we proactively support citizens to be part of solution seeking. So. On the example in Nepal, people will sit down with the, their local authorities, will, with builders, representatives of INGOs who are building those houses and really voice their concerns. Then you will hear from INGO who says, well, actually, we're bound by the contract with the government. And local authority member will say, actually, we can't release money to you because it needs to be approved by central office in Kathmandu. And what it means, it's People can bring their problems and solutions forward and work out what works, what doesn't work. And that way we don't build demand without supply. And it's it's far more um, leveled process. So that's on, on question number one. On question number two, um, it does lead to better project delivery. Because if you are sitting in front of me and you're a contractor who's building a primary school to which I'm going to send my child, I will come back and talk to you day in, day out, day in, day out, because an option is not to send him to private school. Um, when you have passionate someone whose life quality depends on what you do, we all respond, respond differently, we're all human beings. And when you see that person for the third time coming to your office and that person who has brought different options in front of you, you pull your, your heartstrings are pulled and you respond completely differently. Um, I think information also leads to better project delivery because it's visible and it's for everybody to see. What we don't like as human beings and is the world knowing that we are not quite good at our jobs. If someone was watching me, I would be probably giving a little additional 1% and etc. What's really problematic if you're a contractor and you're building, light, uh, building, say, roads, your business depends on next contract and you don't want people to be to start connecting dots and saying hang on you messed it up in location a b and c thank you very much you're never going to get another one and by the way you're someone's sister who sits in local authority um useful insights absolutely what um what authorities in nepal were completely unaware of before this um pilot was that People were selling last bit of everything that they had to keep their housing, housing reconstruction going. Um, people spoke about selling their livestock, and in rural Nepal, that's what <laughs> those those animals will provide food and, and milk for for your children. They're putting themselves out there, taking unsecured loans, uh, and government was proactively, unknowingly making the poorest. Um, another example was that, you know, we're all committed to leave no one behind. Somewhere, somehow, it happened and it wasn't visible from London and it wasn't visible from Washington and etc. Is that the system was set up in a way to really leave the most vulnerable ones last in the queue and they were the first one to drop out of the process and they're the ones who continue to sleep under and the tin roofs and throughout Nepali winters. Um, we have to date worked in over 15 countries and monitored about um, one billion dollars worth of project services and etc. All we care for: Are you delivering on the promise that you have made to citizens? We don't care if you're a business, if you're a government, if you're an NGO. There are people who depend on this work, and we have every intention to build these tools and share them out there to, to develop methodology to really turn this upside down. Um, sorry, I am 
white woman living in London. I'm not British, uh, I'm not monitor, and I don't live in Nepal. So everything you've heard from me was boring. What I really wanted to bring in front of you is a video from one of um, monitors in Nepal who spoke passionately about why does she do this, and what's the benefit, and what are the hopes, and etc. Um, after this session, I will post this video on Twitter. Uh, technology is not allowing us to watch it here and now, but please, please have a look. Oh, is it going? Kind of a little bit choppy, but if you see a video that starts like that, that's, that's the one. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Desmina. Uh, thanks to both our speakers for really fascinating sets of insights. Um, do we have questions on the subjects they've spoken about? I have a couple I can kick off with whilst you think of your... Oh, somebody's already thought of one here at the back. They were very interesting and, ah, magically started working. Um, very interesting and really appreciate hearing your perspectives. Um, I'm curious on the presentation that was just given, how you think about um, whether asking citizens to monitor is placing an unnecessary burden on them. I'm sure this is something you've thought deeply about, so would just love to hear your perspective on um, sort of weighing that burden against other activities they could be doing that, that might be more income oriented or, um, or doing something else. Thanks. Does this, yeah, it works. Um, very good question, thank you very much. Very much at the forefront of our, of our thinking. The thing is, we don't say to people, go and do this, do that. Our local our local deeply embedded civil society partner will say, guys, would you like to gather around? This is what the aims are. This is what we are trying to do. Would you like to step forward? And no one is being paid, paid for this. Uh, and I do know that in loads of programs, people are. But it's an option. And what normally happens, um, out of a full room, loads of people will leave, and you're left with a core group of, say, 10 incredibly passionate people who will take this on. The thing is, through monitoring what we do know, um, there is a quick turnaround on benefits. So very quickly for community, what becomes visible is the tangible, tangible benefit. What normally simultaneously happens is that that core group of people suddenly gets additional recognition within their societies suddenly people will know about them and the thing goes, oh, I've heard your brother has done this or your sister has done that, and na 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 um, it's, It means a lot. It means a lot to all of us. And also in longer term, what it means that is that um, people through that additional visibility will probably enhance their livelihoods and etc. So, yeah, um, we are watching it very, very closely and it's a very good question. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is for Friday. I follow Accountability Lab's work. You guys do really impressive work all over. Um, one, so uh, I work for an organization where our constituency is the business community, the private sector. And I'm just curious to what extent you see civic tech engaging people as both citizens and entrepreneurs um, or people working in MSMEs because it's like over 80% of Nigerians work in um, MSMEs. And I'm just curious, do you see opportunities to sort of engage the public in both their sort of um, representations as citizens and as part of the business or entrepreneurial community? And might that have um, a different impact just in terms of how people interact with technology or what the incentives are to engage or, for example, um, um, 
you know, say if they've had to bribe or anything like that. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and one of the things we, we also looked at is Paystack. Paystack is um, it's a payment solution in Nigeria, which um, is more like profits um, for profits system of tech. Um, it's actually having more impact than civic tech in itself, where you have for not for profits. Um, um, exciting spaces in um, Lagos as well. People are getting into that platform where um, it pays off. So it's more like having an incentive for like an outcome kind of thing where you have to make more money out of it. So it's, I think that has more impact. You can actually see the impact in the society where more people are getting into um, e-commerce e and e-governance kind of thing. Um, but however, it's, it's, it's a pin of challenge when you want to implement those systems in government. Um, there's always a pushback. Um, so where this is where we could bring in corruption, where people pre prefer to have money from hand, um, sorry, sorry to say this, money from hand to hand, right? Rather than use those kind of platforms. So these are the challenges we've seen, but however, I think this is a good solution for us. Yep. Sure. Does that answer you? Good. Good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you to both of the presenters. I have a question for Friday as well. Last month's elections in Nigeria were very expensive, they're very intransparent, and it also caused a backlash in terms of the democratic processes. The entire process had to be shifted for an entire week, which caused disruption in business, which caused disruption in government, etc. Has this very punctured disruption in the democratic process had impacts on what you've been seeing online as well? Has, have the recent elections that took place on a national level in Nigeria and their crass impacts on the electoral process insofar as that they were delayed, they were logistically challenged, and so on, so on and so forth. Have they, had, have they shown impacts in the democratic processes that you're seeing online right now? Um, I, I'm, I'm just looking at um, a colleague from Makata if she wants to support me to answer that because, yeah, yeah. So I think it's, it's okay, um, I'll speak after you, yeah. Sure, um, I'm only supporting Friday, it's still his question. Uh, the civic space has been expanding in Nigeria. We cannot learn that lesson from the 2015 elections when an opposition candidate became president. It's never happened before in Nigeria. It's always been the incumbent who gets another term and the incumbent's chosen, as it were. And that happened because there was a lot of connection of voices, young voices, um, people who have been missing in the equation in the demographics of election. And we saw more of that in the one week you referred to when the elections were postponed. Um, it was a plus minus situation. Some people thought, um, well, um, a lot of fake news came on as to or kind of conspiracy theories as to why the elections were, had to be postponed. Um, but it was also an opportunity to further energize citizens to say, you don't give up. Whatever is the agenda is, this is about us. And Nigeria is a very interesting country. Some of the presentations that we've listened to, um, people design tools to track um, an election where people have an agenda that is very clear. In, in the part of a country where we work in, sometimes you need the tool to ensure that people think about an agenda after they have emerged to run for office. So you can begin to see the kind of power to that civic tech is giving to people, ordinary people. I think the challenge in terms of driving the impact home would, would lie in terms of who has access, whose voice is it? Who is able to um, drive, whose agenda is it at the end of the day? And how do we further step that down to look at the different diversities that might be um, still ununderstood and therefore unrepresented? So it's still a work in progress in terms of the impact of that. Okay, um, just to add to that. Um, so interestingly, the online space is an exciting space. Um, but nevertheless, as you mentioned, fake news is one of the big deals in um, Nigeria as well. So you, so on the day of election, I was at one of the um, voting centers, and I said to somebody, 
Um, don't believe what you read on Twitter. It's, it's interesting what is happening at the polling station and people are on, on online saying stuff. So that could also cause another kind of impact and affect people's minds, change their mindset and all that. So um, while engaging people online, we we'll have to be careful with the kind of information we pass as well. Uh, thank you. Any other questions? Hi, um, I really enjoyed the presentations. Does that come on? Yeah. Um, I have a question for Jasmina. Um, the, uh, my question is, have you experienced um, much pushback uh, from those contractors about like unfair characterization of the aims and um, how have you dealt with that, if you have? We have, and we continue to. Um, people, as I, as I said to us, it doesn't matter whether projects have been delivered by business sector, governmental sector, or charitable sector. What normally happens is people, as we reach out to them and say, this is what's going to happen, they go like, no, we're not giving you um, a sign-off because we don't like being third-party monitoring, especially when it's coming from citizens. They can deal with an organization doing it, but with citizens, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. Normal excuses are people are stupid, they don't understand what our work is so complex and etc. and our answer is always the same. Your, your work is worth nothing if it's not changing people's lives for better. And by the way, we have freedom of information if not in the country where we work, but then we do have it on donor countries. So, you know, you can push back, but it's not going to go too, too far. Um, and that's usually your initial conversation. Um, sometimes people are, people are worried about corruption being found out, and they will try to stop it and etc. What normally happens a year into it all running is people who are not corrupt begin to observe benefits. So on local authority side, they will gain um, additional resources. So they, they will never be able to employ enough people to visit every single project in every single village. But suddenly, through platform, they can see exactly what's going on. They begin to know um, monitors. They begin to know uh, communities on different level. And that means that they can really issue their resources where it matters. We have an interesting example in Indonesia, where Indonesian Ministry of Health wanted to observe quality of services provided to people living with HIV. Their global fund grant is, is dependent on it. So there was a lot of money in question. And as the pilot got rolled out, what became very, very clear is that uh, there were three health centers in Indonesia where people living with HIV will travel hundreds of kilometers to get there. And when asked, but why do you do that? They will say, there's a really compassionate doctor that doesn't judge if, you know, ignores the fact that I'm obviously a sex worker or ignores the fact what my sexual choices and preferences are. They're just compassionate human beings that are trying to help me. Um, till then, ministry was really pursuing these very expensive pathways of thinking, oh, maybe distribution of whatever is not good enough and etc. And what became very clear is most of your doctors and nurses are incredibly prejudiced and they're awful to patients. Second thing is you can't take a blood sample and then not let me know for a couple of months whether I'm living with a virus or not. It needs to be available then and there. Um, and what that meant is that the government could intervene in a very focused way. So I would say corrupt people will forever hate it, but they can't fight it. People who are not corrupt but genuinely want to do better very quickly realize they benefit from it. And one thing that typically happens in any country or any region where we work, it starts a little bit slowly, then the word spreads, and then it takes off. And um, what is absolutely fantastic is that we don't see fatigue among citizens at all. It's quite the opposite, because they trust it. it de it's theirs, it belongs to them. Okay, just remains to thank again our two wonderful speakers. Please join me.